quick announcement. Uh, today, office hours are going to be a little shorter because I'm giving a guest lecture in the recombinant DNA techniques lecture. So um, those of you in that class get to hear me for two hours. So much fun. Um, and that probably means that I did a horrible job preparing today's lecture, which is why I put in lots of really obnoxious clicker questions um, at the beginning, just to make everyone feel happy. So let's, without further ado, get started <coughs> with those. Deletion of which of the following proteins was used in the most promising oncolytic adenovirus? Adenovirus? When was that? That was like forever ago. Like Monday. Talk amongst yourselves. You can do that today. You can't do it two weeks from Tuesday. <laughs> Just be really, really quiet about it then. <laughs> Ten. Time to start guessing. Okay. Uh, nobody. Actually, I oh know somebody did like D. Good. Okay. But basically, nobody likes C, D, or E. Um, why not? Because they didn't sound right. Um, this case may be the <clears throat> L1. Why not L1? It's a structural protein, and if it's actually making virus, then that's not going to have anything to do with oncolytic purposes. Uh, so E1A or E1B seem to be what most people are thinking. Uh, these are the ones that are really regulating cell cycle. Um, again, like most of the early proteins, particularly these very early proteins, we'll talk more about those, we'll talk about the herpes virus later on today. Uh, E1A is doing what? Positional activation and also interacting with what part of the cellular? P more RB, actually. Um, what about E1B? That's the one that interacts with P53. What's mutated in most cancers? P53. And so if you're missing E1B, then you have to worry about the P53 processes. If you're in a normal cell, then they'll be regulating with P53. So it is, in fact, E1B, not E1A. Hopefully the rest of these will be much more straightforward. So <clears throat> this one is from the lecture on Wednesday. I have not heard that lecture, so I don't know what he said. I hope he did say some of these things. If not, then we're all in trouble. Um, so the parvovirus in 81 is what kind of package genome? Single-stranded DNA, double-stranded DNA, single-stranded RNA negative strand, single-stranded RNA positive strand, double-stranded RNA. <laughs> he better recover this. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully, that'd be good. And then I can tell George you did a great job. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I mean, I'm not sure if it's making like a double stranded DNA and then start transferring. 
and three, two, one. George did a good job. Yes, it's packaging single-stranded DNA. Um, you could argue that it's partially double-stranded when it's actually in the virion, um, but I'm not going to get into that anymore right now because for the most part, it's single-stranded. Um, and that actually should probably be a single molecule rather than single-stranded versus double-stranded. And that, unfortunately, the standard terminology is single-stranded and double-stranded. Mm -hmm. I much prefer the single versus two-molecule thing. But if I started doing that, then... Everybody would hate me. So, um, not that they don't already, but that's of course a different story. So, yeah, exactly. So, hopefully, George talked about this one as well. Um, what's the primer for parvovirus replication? RNA, by, by, RNA made by cellular RNA polymerase, by viral RNA polymerase, of protein, the AV1 genome itself, or a beluga whale? <laughs> <laughs> well, that normalizes out. <laughs> but do you trust all the other people in the room? That's that's the question. It's the thing. I like that. <laughs> Sites are almost all the same. We're not happy to post it. Ten. <laughs> it looks like George did such a fabulous job. I should get him to do all my lectures, right? Uh, so yes, it's the A by one genome, and I overheard someone say the thing which I thought was a perfect explanation for the secondary structure which forms at the end of the genome. And that's what provides the primer for the replication um, happening in these particular viruses. Um, and yeah, no one likes my beluga whale, but I was mentioning um, here up front, there are a number of whale herpes viruses. Like some of the herpes viruses you find in pretty much all organisms anyone's looked at, you find herpes viruses. So um, this is a, a quick aside here. So um, the last question that hopefully also did a really good job of talking about was the virus that he's working on, um, which is the first RDHV genome was found in Iceland human stool, Titicot Lake, algae or fungi. I just let George give all my lectures, obviously. This is you know, by far and away the, the best way to do it. Now, um, that being said, um, we think there are going to be chimeric viruses probably in all of these places. 
So it's just the first one was found in this uh, acidic hot lake. And in fact, we should probably stop calling them RNA DNA hybrid viruses um, because it confuses people a little bit because that's clearly where they came from originally. But now they're clearly DNA viruses, single stranded DNA viruses, which is why he talked about them in the single stranded DNA virus lecture. Okay, so are there any more questions about that lecture? I'm going to, um, he didn't post the slides, did he? No. Okay, yeah, I will try and make sure that happens. Um, unfortunately, he's disappeared for the weekend too, you know, I disappear, he disappears. Um, but I will um, make sure that that happens, um, certainly by next week. Um, any other questions about his lecture? Yeah. Do you have any speculation around why Thomas viruses are Oh, so why the RNA part of the you know, RNA-DNA hybrid virus uh, are, are similar to the Thomas viruses? Uh, that's an absolutely fabulous question. Um, and in fact, it's one of the ones that we put into our grant proposal that was submitted today to NASA. <laughs> um, we don't know, but we have some suspicions. Um, it turns out that the structure of that particular protein, which is very well known, um, has a couple of positively charged amino acid residues sort of stick on the inside, a lot like some of the cucumber mosaic virus, some of these N-terminal helices that are highly positively charged. Uh, and we're wondering if we change that sequence at all, whether that would then allow it to package DNA as opposed to RNA. Not that there's a different charge, but at least this is a possibility. Um, and if you look at the sequences, that particular sequence is missing in the RDHVs, but present in all of these ones that are packaging RNA. So, kind of a smoking gun, but that's big hand waving at this point. <laughs> uh, but yeah, but again, how, how did these things get together? I was, I, did he use the green pig slide? No. So my favorite description of this is so the RDHV half the genome looks like this plant virus, and half of it looks like a pig virus. So I call it the green pig virus. And if you go and look online for green pigs, what do you find? Angry birds. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, yeah. Well, let's. That, well, we're going to talk a little bit about that. Are you taking the recombinant DNA lecture? Yeah, we'll talk a little bit about that um, in about an hour. A little over that. Okay. So um, today, oh, let me hide these. Don't need these anymore. Um, herpes viruses. So these are sort of in our progression. Skipping Wednesday. Um, Getting, going from the smaller double-stranded DNA viruses, the papillomaviruses, the Popova viruses, um, through adenoviruses getting bigger, now herpes viruses, next week pox viruses, and then BB viruses, um, even bigger. So the largest double-stranded DNA viruses, both in terms of their genomes, but also in terms of their virions. So we're just sort of progressing up that sort of size ladder here. Um, again, not surprising. Bigger is more complex. Again, they're bringing more and more of their own machinery along for the ride, as it were, becoming more and more autonomous. And so they can replicate in lots of different kinds of places, including, obviously, for herpes viruses and neurons, um, which are generally not, excuse me, very good at undergoing DNA replication. But you know, these guys do a really good job of that. But that's partly because they're bringing so many of their own proteins um, along to do that. Um, in a bigger picture, there are, in fact, a lot of similarities between herpes viruses and particularly the nucleocapsid in terms of the structure and bacteriophage. Um, so the way that packaging works, the way that the DNA gets put into the capsid, how you put the capsid together, a lot of these things are extremely similar to what you see in bacteriophage. Um, there are a couple of differences, of course, um, and those are the ones that Stedman loves to harp on. Uh, particularly latent infections. This is sort of you know classic when people think about herpes viruses. Once infected, um, these viruses have evolved ways to basically hang out inside of cells, and then years later, in many cases, then actually be stimulated to undergo replications. This latent infection process. And, it's not really well known exactly how that works. It's a lot to do with small RNAs, and now more we're learning about small RNAs in terms of cellular regulation. Um, also, is allowing us to learn more about what's going on in latent infection, but it's a very active area of research right now. 
Um, the tegument, tegument is something that we haven't talked about before, basically because none of the viruses we've talked about have had teguments. Uh, and that's because herpes viruses are enveloped viruses, but they have a really clear icosahedral nucleocapsid. Teguments is what's between the envelope and the nucleocapsid. When we look at some of the EMs in a couple of minutes, actually I think on the next slide, uh, we'll see that there's a lot of space between the envelope and the nucleocapsid. This is very different than a lot of the enveloped RNA viruses we talked about. They just had matrix proteins, which is literally like right next to the envelope. It's right next to the nucleocapsid. Um, whereas here's a pretty big space, and in that space, so-called tegument, um, are many proteins, which it turns out are really important for the infection process. Recombination. We've talked about recombination quite a bit already. Um, beluga whale, coronaviruses. Um, recombination happens between RNAs for making nested subgenomic RNAs. Turns out the recombination, probably important for herpes virus disease, it happens a lot. And if you block recombination, then you have lower amounts of pathogenesis. Still, however, the viruses replicate, so it's not entirely clear what's going on there, but recombination is happening here, just like recombination we've talked about in many other cases, repeated sequences. So there are a number of repeated sequences in these genomes. VP16, again, you know, horrible nomenclature here, virus protein 16, uh, but it's one of those few that I am going to expect you to remember. Um, because it's a particular protein that's been used by you know, many, many researchers um, way above and beyond in the herpes virus field. VP16 is one of the most potent transcriptional activators around. Uh, and so a lot of what we know about transcriptional activation has to do with the study of VP16 or VP16 hooked up to some other um, particular protein. Uh, the other thing which is very interesting in people studying herpes virus replication is there's very little splicing. So we talked about splicing regulation. Was that you, um, David, last time I think asked about someone asked about splicing regulation and how um, viruses are regulating splicing or have they own splicing machinery? Again, I don't know of any that have their own, but one of the things that herpes viruses do is they really shut down splicing. Um, and so it's a very important part of their regulatory processes that they shut down um, the splicing process. Yeah. Um, as a general trend, when you say these bigger viruses bring more and more machinery with, with them, as mm -hmm. a general trend, do you think they've evolved this extra machinery on their own, or they still want to? <laughs> uh, I just love these kinds of questions. So uh, these are the with you know, lots of eye rolling in the process. Right. You can't see that on tape. Uh, <laughs> the <clears throat> the question is basically, you know, are these viruses that are in the process of reducing? their genomes, or are they in the process of adding more things to their genomes? And I think the easy answer to that is, again, probably both, or yes, um, as the case may be. But <clears throat> there, I think it might be a little easier to, well, I don't know, think about. Almost everyone thinks that viruses are polyphyletic, so they're not all coming from one single universal viral ancestor. And so it's quite possible that some viruses are clearly accumulating lots of genes, but other viruses are in the process of losing genes. And so you're going to have some of both, I think, is the really convoluted answer or non-answer to your question. <laughs> uh, but it really does seem, so a lot, of, a lot of the genes here, and we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about this, talk much more about when we talk about pox viruses next week, is that many of the proteins that these viruses have that are doing some of these jobs are actually very different than the cellular proteins. So it's hard to imagine that they've picked up a cellular protein in order to do that job. And so, if anything, I think it's a you know, different virus lineages that are probably doing different things. Okay, so our sort of standard outline here, um, what does he care about? It's these uh, red things here. Again, these are the things which are gonna be very different in these particular viruses relative to many of the other ones. But we'll still talk a little bit about origins. This is, again, it's disease, structure. Um, this one is mentioned in the tegument. So here's the nucleocapsid, there's the envelope, and there's this big area in between. Um, that's the tegument here. Binding and entry is relatively straightforward. Um, transcription and replication, these are the things which are really quite different as far as these viruses are concerned. Um, getting out of the cell is actually quite different as well. 
um, not in fact is well known, so we won't talk too much more about that. Um, herpes viruses are basically everywhere. Uh, the main one that's been studied is herpes simplex virus, or HSV-1, um, which is very closely related to HSV-2, causing genital herpes. Chicken pox, and another wonderful example of how the pox virus actually has nothing to do with this particular disease. Um, it's just the symptoms that you see, the, the raised blisters, um, are very generally similar to each other. Um, but this is a herpes virus, which is causing chicken pox. Um, mononucleosis, Epstein-Barr virus, which is also connected to Burkitt's lymphoma. We're not going to talk about that. There's a whole section in the textbook that goes into that, but we're not going to have time to get there. Uh, there. It wasn't thought that these herpes viruses did cause cancer until um, first there was Burkitt's lymphoma, which is mostly in sub-Saharan Africa and it's probably connected to malaria um, and some interesting cellular, actually organismal reactions to malaria. So again, really cool story that I don't have time to get into. Uh, but no one had really thought that these herpes viruses were associated with cancer until HIV and immune suppression really came along. And that's when it became much more obvious that a number of these herpes viruses can cause cancer. And the classic one was uh, polysarcoma, which was the you know, HIV cancer, basically, uh, that people are finding. Cytomegalovirus, um, this is a herpes virus that probably four or five of us in this room don't have. Uh, it's incredibly widespread, causes very little in the way of disease, but modulates the immune system in, again, really fascinating ways that we may have a chance to talk about at the end, um, but is also the basis for a really exciting biotech company based out of OHSU. I don't know how many of you heard Klaus Fru's talk in the biology department uh, a few months ago. Um, he's one of the co-founders of this company. So really um, potentially interesting HIV vaccines, anti-malarials, um, et cetera. So there's going to be an anti-HIV vaccine trial happening um, this fall uh, based on some of the stuff that they're doing. Um, as I mentioned probably far too many times now, um, herpes viruses are everywhere. Fish herpes viruses, whale herpes viruses, sort of you name it. Um, they're all over the place and usually very, very mild infections. Um, not, a, not a big deal. Um, again, most people don't even know that they're CMV positive. Um, in fact, it's a bit of an issue for their clinical trials is trying to find people who um, are or aren't CMV positive because it's a relatively small group um, as far as that's concerned. So uh, the <clears throat> thing that, again, people talk about herpes. Uh, so one of my colleagues, sorry, we keep going to these asides here, uh, down at Oregon State University, uh, Rebecca Vega Thurber, um, did a whole study on viruses infecting corals. And one of the viruses that she found was a herpes virus. And Stephen Colbert got really excited about this. It's like, the corals got herpes. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and that's, of course, because of the you know, labial and genital lesions, which are the kinds of things that most people think about when people think about herpes virus diseases. Um, and this whole process of latent infections and stress-related um, coming back up again here. But these are um, just a few of many, many, many different ones. Uh, particularly important, and what makes them a lot easier to study, are these... Uh, ones that when most people think about herpes, this will be your herpes simplex virus, um, these lesions, which grow pretty quickly um, and are latent in neurons. Um, another set, and again, most people think this um, neurotrophic, not all herpes viruses are neurotrophic and go into lots of other cells. Um, the beta herpes viruses and hypsotomegalovirus is the best of known of those, are in completely different um, kinds of cells. And then the gamma herpes viruses are latent in white blood cells. And so latency can happen in all kinds of different places um, relative to these different viruses. We're mostly going to talk about um, herpes simplex, mostly because it grows quickly and it's a heck of a lot easier to work with in the lab than most of these other ones. So if you look at the HSV1 genome, and again, for the most part today, we're going to be talking about HSV1. It looks like this. You know, again, huh? who cares? Um, big genome. 150 KB in size, so 150,000 relative to the about 5,000 that we were talking about. We talk about the papilloma and the papogoviruses. Two segments, again, very creatively named the large and small segment. Uh, 
and also have these repeated sequences. And so this is why I talk about recombination um, as what's going on there. So these A sequences um, are <clears throat> the positions. Oh, hang on, where's my pointer? Eh. These A sequences are relatively short sequences, um, complete repeated sequences, which are where you undergo recombination. And this recombination, a lot like pre-recombination that I'm, I'm going to talk about way too much in the next hour, um, is an inversion re um, recombination that happens because these sequences are complements of each other. So you look at A, here's A prime, that's the inverted repeat of that. So what that means is you invert these segments relative to each other. So you can have this large segment in the same orientation as a small segment and flip them over relative to each other as far as all these genome segments are concerned. Um, this does seem to be important for pathogenesis, but quite why is not entirely clear. There are also these other repeated sequences. These A sequences are between U and S and, and also at the very termini of the genomes. But then in each of the large segments and the small segments, there are repeated sequences as well. So the small sequence has these inverted repeats at either end. The large sequence has these inverted repeats at either end. And this seems to be very important for packaging as well as the recombination purposes. If you look at the genome here, again, as a comparison purpose, it's a little hard to see, but uh, this is Phi X174, nice small size mark. This is an electron micrograph looking at DNA now. And here's the beginning of your HSV DNA. And you can follow this all the way along, all the way over to the other side. Um, and that's the other end. And in fact, before people had DNA sequencing, this is how you measured the sizes of genomes. Is <laughs> you would literally take the DNA, put it in an electron micrograph, blow it up actually to about this size, and literally measure your way along it. Um, because it was hard to do um, big DNA sequencing at the time. What's coded for in here? A ridiculous number of genes. I am not going to expect you to remember all of them. Don't worry. Um, but those that have little arrows and circles might be good ones to think about. So um, we'll get to these guys down here um, in just a second. Um, this is now a circular orientation of the genome. Um, here's the short segment here, the long segment over here. Um, U, by the way, just stands for unique i.e. non-repeated sequences in each of those genomes, or genome segments, I should say. And then these, again, the B is an inverted repeat of either end of the large segment, and C is an inverted repeat of this shorter segment. So one of the things that you can see here is in these inverted repeat sequences, in both the large segment and the small segment, are a couple of genes. Um, alpha 0 and alpha 4, which are repeated, you know, alpha 0 and alpha 4, because these pieces of the genome are repeated as well. We'll look at the splicing that happens in there. There's little uh, bumps as well that are happening um, in that particular process. You'll also notice the blue arrows. Those are the ones that represent the latent transcripts. These are the ones which get turned on when you have latent replications, basically shutting down all the rest of replication in the virus and can then be induced. How latency works is relatively clear. Actually, it's just the expression of these particular RNAs that leads to latent replication of the virus. It's the induction process, going from latency in order to actually be replicating, which is not very well understood at all. Um, then there are these other genes over here, um, VP16, also known as alpha TIF. And VHS, VHS stand for? Not, beta, not the opposite of beta, no? Anybody old enough to get that joke? Yeah. Yeah, a few of you. Uh, so, yeah. Exactly. Viral host shut off. Um, so really, these are the genes which you need very early on in the process of virus infection. DP16, as I mentioned already, is a really strong transcriptional activator. It's also known as alpha TIF, um, transcriptional initiation factor. Um, I did need to mention here um, alpha, beta, and gamma that we'll get back to a little bit later on as well. Uh, these are just like we've talked about early, middle, late. 
Um, the herpes virologists want to have something different, so they call it you know, alpha, beta, and gamma, but basically it's the same thing. Now, very early, early or middle genes and late genes. So very similar, again, as we talked about particularly originally with the bacteriophage in terms of early, middle, and, and late genes. So we'll get back and talk about the, the functions of all these guys in just a second. Where do you find them? Here's our cartoon of the capsid. I don't really like this electron micrograph at all, but it's supposed to show you the icosahedral nucleocapsid in the middle, the envelope on the outside, and the tegument in between. Yeah, sure, exactly. That's why I like the green one that I had a little bit earlier better. Um, so this is the cartoon. Here we have our icosahedral. It's, in fact, a pseudo-equivalent icosahedron with, interestingly enough, a different vertex, one of the five-fold axes of <coughs> symmetry of this icosahedron has a portal protein um, that's associated with it. Again, very similar to a lot of the bacteriophage, which have one of those five-fold axes. It's very different. Most of it's made up of the VP5 protein, um, arranged in a, again, very normal, as it were, um, quasi-equivalent icosahedral structure. Then you've got the envelope proteins, um, lots and lots of different glycoproteins in the envelope, and then this distance between the two, and that again is where the, the tegument is. It turns out there are a whole bunch of different virus proteins that end up in this tegument, um, including VP16 and VHS that we'll get back to in just a second, um, but well more than that as well. There are also messenger RNAs that are packaged in the tegument, so the tegument is sort of the extra bag of bad news um, that Sir Peter Medawar was talking about when talking about viruses. <laughs> so the bag here um, being the envelope and the bad news even before you get to the capsid, um, which is present on the inside. So these are very important, <coughs> excuse me, proteins for very early stages of the infection process. And it, it makes sense if you think about where do you want to get these particular gene products as soon as you have membrane fusion, what happens? You're going to release whatever proteins are in the tegument before you actually have to break down the nucleocapsid. So um, it makes sense, again, over-anthropomorphizing this whole process. Um, so I, again, probably been beating on this a little bit too much, but the nucleocapsid itself has an extremely regular icosahedral structure. Um, maybe a little hard to find, but here's our five-fold axis of symmetry right here. If we go from this five-fold axis of symmetry to that five-fold axis of symmetry, what do you get? One, two, three, four. It's going to be what kind of pseudo T equals four squared plus four times. Oh, God, it was like so long ago that we did icosahedral symmetry. I can't even remember it. So H squared plus H K plus K squared. H is four. K is zero. Pseudo T equals 16. Yes, no, Friday, it's gray. Uh, okay, but <clears throat> yeah, very much so. But this is the icosahedral reconstruction, which doesn't have the portal protein. I should have pulled that up, but there's clearly a portal protein there. How do you get in? It's first a fusion, leach for HSV, it happens at the plasma membrane. In many cases, it also happens in endosomes, just varies from herpes virus to herpes virus. These are the various proteins that it seems to bind to. Very common proteoglycans that you find on the outside of cells. So many cells actually can be at least infected by a lot of these viruses. Once you have infection that takes place, now of course you've released all of these tegument proteins the nucleocapsid gets transported all the way to the nucleus and only at the nucleus does the genome get released through a nuclear pore into the nucleus. And one of the things that I forgot to mention is that these nucleocapsids are pretty big. They're almost you know, 200, <clears throat> um, 200 angstroms across. They're, they're really big um, kinds of capsids relative to a lot of the other you know, much, much smaller viruses. And you can see that here. Um, if we talk about <clears throat> some of the parvoviruses, 
you can actually get the whole virion um, inside the nucleus. And that's also true in some of these other smaller viruses. Think about Popova viruses, SB40. Um, it's the whole virion which gets in, as opposed to here, this nucleocapsid is far too big to actually um, get into the nucleus. Once the genome is released, um, the genome is packaged, as you saw in the cartoon, as a linear double-stranded DNA. But as soon as it gets into the nucleus, it circularizes a lot like what kind of viral genome? Linear going to circular. Man, good crowd today. <laughs> Lambda. The Lambda virus. Linear packaged, gets inside the cell, circularizes. So, hmm, we've got a capsid that looks like something which is bacteriophage-like. The genome, linear, becomes circular, a lot like bacteriophage. Again, this should sound very, very familiar here. Um, there's some really nice micrographs of this, partly because... Oh, sorry, here. Oh, just the, back to the diagram. Yeah. It seems to imply that the tegument proteins stay with the nuclear capsid to the membrane, to the nuclear membrane. There's nothing else going on to the cytoplasm. So the, the, the question here, again, it's just, just to repeat it, is, you know, um, are these tegument proteins all associated with the nuclear capsid? It's basically shown, I don't know where I get my darn pointer thing here. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. Um, tegument proteins um, right here associated with the capsid. Um, yes, some of them are staying associated with the capsid and actually get brought in and put into the nucleus. Uh, VP16 is a really nice example of that because it's a transcriptional regulator. How much transcription is happening in the cytoplasm? Nada. So clearly that's something which has to be brought in. Some of the other proteins that are in the tegument that we're they're not going to talk about very much, are involved in escaping some of the innate immunity, which is present inside the cell. Those then have to be active in the cytoplasm, because that's where they are detecting a lot of these things which are going on. So it's some of both is the answer to that question. OK, but now, since these guys are so big, um, you can actually follow quite nicely the <clears throat> nucleocapsid as it enters the cell. So this is H, uh, HSV1 binding to the plasma membrane. Here's that nucleocapsid. Here's the <clears throat> external membrane. The tegument's right in between here. You have fusion. The nucleocapsid is released. It gets transported all the way to the nuclear membrane. And at the nuclear membrane, the genome is lost. But the nucleocapsid actually seems to stay pretty intact um, at the nuclear membrane. So should again seem really like bacteriophage because they leave their capsids on the outside. Instead now of leaving your capsid on the outside of the bacteria, it's leaving your nuclear capsid on the outside of the nucleus. Yeah, Luke. Does uh, infection with herpes virus confer any sort of um, non-permissivity to other uh, herpes infections? Oh, so kind of like, so I, again, I'm paraphrasing your question here, but do you get super infection immunity <laughs> um, like you do with a lot of the bacteriophage? The answer is I don't know. Uh, possibly yes, but again, I, I really don't know any of the details on that. Um, certainly CMV, um, cytomegalovirus, does seem to confer some interesting protective um, features as far as that's concerned. But that's kind of beyond the scope of this course. <laughs> Okay, so now that I've beaten on this enough, um, hopefully, <laughs> we shall see. Um, the HSV1 nucleocapsid is most similar to the nucleocapsid of Ebola, SARS, MS2, T7, or measles. See if I do as good a job explaining things as, as George does. <laughs> 
George is obviously better than me. Oops. We could actually see our there we go. Um, responses here. Uh, Ebola, negative strand packaged in this, you know, ridiculously long nucleocapsid filamenta, SARS, coronavirus, also helical nucleocapsid, MS2, really tiny little, um, no isometry to it whatsoever, T7, nice asymmetric icosahedral particle. It's not a T equals 16, but it's um, otherwise, and, and measles also enveloped um, these kinds of, <coughs> excuse me, helical structure with your, your N protein. So clearly the answer is D, but um, I didn't do a good enough job of explaining. And again, I should clearly get George to come back and do a few more lectures for you. Okay, so <clears throat> let's talk about some of the transcripts which are being made. I mentioned this already. Um, alpha, beta, and gamma. This is just early, middle, and late, basically, relative to what we've talked about before. Um, now we're just looking at the very early genes here. Here are the, you know, also known as the alpha genes, um, ICP0 and ICP4, which are the ones we talked about. You'll notice they've got these little bumps in them, and that means that they are being spliced. Um, it's basically only the very, very early genes, the alpha genes, which are the ones who get spliced. Um, basically, all of the later genes, um, particularly all of our gamma ones, but many of the beta ones as well, are also not spliced. And that's because, of course, that the splicing machinery gets turned off um, by the infection by these, <coughs> these viruses. So these, again, are also in the repeated region of the genome. Uh, if you remember the short segment, long segment, um, those repeated ones have these um, ICP0 particularly and also ICP4. Um, I mentioned VP16, but we'll start with VHS because um, VHS is involved in degradation of RNA, but also in blocking cellular splicing. And it degrades all spliced RNAs, um, doesn't degrade any of the <clears throat> other ones. VP16, again, also known as the alpha transcriptional initiation factor, it's present in the tegument. Um, it needs cellular, what also are called co-activators, or also what's really curious is people saw VP16 as this great transcriptional activator protein, but it didn't bind to DNA. I was like, what the heck? Now, how can you have a transcriptional activator that's not binding to DNA? Well, the way that it works is it binds to these cellular DNA binding proteins, which are really important for the activation of transcription when bound to VP16. And one of the ways that you can tell that the early genes relative to the late genes, the alpha and the beta and the gammas, just has to do with their promoter structures and how they're functioning. So if you look at ICP4, again, one of the classic early genes, so the alpha genes, it's got all of these binding sites next to its promoter, including VP16, but also lots and lots of cellular proteins. SP1, specificity factor 1, we already talked about SP1, we talked about SP40, very first enhancer binding protein ever to be found. Um, also has a binding site for its own gene here. This is turning on its own transcription very early on, but as soon as you get enough of this particular protein, what does it do? It binds to the promoter and shuts itself off. Hmm, should sound a lot like, what other virus? Lambda, exactly, because you know, production of this particular protein will eventually shut off its own promoter. However, if you start to look at some of the beta genes and the gamma genes, again, these are your later proteins. These will have a couple of cellular regulatory sequences, but later and later you're going to have just these different sequences, which are either just Tata boxes or very minimal promoters, and this downstream activating sequence, which is being regulated by viral proteins and viral proteins only. So you've moved from, at the very early genes, the alpha genes, being very dependent on cellular regulators to the later genes being dependent on the <clears throat> viral regulatory proteins. Although, interestingly enough, VP16 is a very late expressed protein. Well, why would it be a late expressed protein? 
Well, because it's in the pegument. It's already there. You don't need to express it. It's something which is already there and already present. So let's talk a little bit more about VP16. Um, again, it's one of the best transcriptional activators anyone had ever found. Uh, way back when, last course, we talked about how you know you have a transcriptional activator. Um, you've got large stretches of really sticky parts of your protein. Um, and in this case, it's an acidic activation domain. And it stimulates basically everything you could possibly think of in terms of transcriptional activation. Uh, pulling together the pre-initiation complex, so getting the RNA polymerase to the right promoter, stimulates elongation, moves nucleosomes out of the way, basically the whole nine yards. And that's shown here in the other textbook. Here we have VP16. Once you get it associated with DNA, helps you to bind not only the general transcription factor, TF2D, but most importantly gets your RNA polymerase here. Also will stimulate the rearrangement of nucleosomes. Again here, your VP16 allowing you to get transcription in nucleosome bound templates. How does it work? As again I mentioned, um, BP16 itself doesn't bind to DNA. It has to associate with some cellular factors to do that. Um, and that's specifically this protein called OCT1. OCT1 will bind to DNA. Once it binds to DNA, it's a change in structure. It's supposed to be shown here. Here we have our DNA binding by OCT1. You see some of these helices are now arranged differently relative to each other. Once these helices are arranged differently relative to each other, then they can bind to VP16, this nice purple blob here. Um, VP16 then also interacts with a very common cellular protein, HCF, and that's the one that's probably most important for rearranging nucleosomes. Um, and so you've got all of these cellular proteins that are basically sort of ready to go to get taken over by the VP16 in order to stimulate transcription. What are these things that are getting stimulated by VP16? They're mostly the alpha proteins, and the alpha proteins are going to be these ones that we've talked about already, um, ICP0 and ICP4. We can ignore the rest of these um, for now, with the exception of IPC, ICP27. Um, ICP0 um, also activates transcription, and so you start activating ICP0 with VP16, that then leads to this cascade. It's going to start to activate more and more genes. Same thing is true with ICP4, um, but ICP4 also has that self-regulatory role. Right at the end, it'll come back and bind to its own promoter. And then, just like VHS, ICP27 is involved in regulating splicing, uh, blocks RNA splicing from happening, Blocking RNA splicing from happening means that most cellular RNAs, of course, are spliced. Most of these viral RNAs, particularly the later RNAs, are not being spliced. So these are the alpha or early proteins, again, transcriptional regulators of viral genes and splicing regulators. So what do these genes turn on? They turn on the classic early proteins. What are early proteins involved in, usually? This process, which, man, I skipped the slide, <laughs> replication. And so the replication in herpes viruses is, again, one of these processes that the virus is bringing along a lot of its own machinery so that it can replicate. And particularly if you think about herpes simplex viruses replicating in neurons. Well, most neurons are not actively undergoing replication. So how can it manage to do that? Well, what it does is it brings a lot of its own machinery with it. It's got origin recognition proteins, it's got single-stranded DNA binding proteins, it's got its own primase, it's got its own DNA polymerase, it's got its own processivity factor. So basically, everything that's involved in replication is all being brought along with the virus genome. And so a lot of these beta proteins are really the DNA replication proteins. How does DNA replication take place? Um, you can probably guess, given helicases, DNA polymerases, processivity factors, origin binding complexes, 
Again, very similar to cellular processes, except that this is all viral proteins now that are involved in this process. Origin binding proteins, you'll notice I'm not saying the names, I'm not expecting to remember all of them. Um, you have then bidirectional replication that takes place from multiple origins. There's the small origin, large origin of replication. Those then will do this theta replication process until you get very late in infection, and then it seems to switch over to a rolling circle process, which again should sound very, very familiar based on the replication processes of things like lambda. The other thing that these viruses encode, um, because they're infecting cells that are generally not undergoing a whole bunch of replication, are a number of proteins that are required to make precursors for DNA replication. If the cell is not normally going through the S phase, it's not going to have a lot of deoxyribonucleotide triphosphates. It'll have plenty of ribonucleotide triphosphates because those are what's being needed for RNA and transcription happens even in these differentiated cells. But replication is not happening. So what do you need? You need thymidine because you have uracil, of course, in your RNA. So you need to have a thymidine, thymidine kinase, and a ribosyl, uh, sorry, ribonucleotide reductase. What do ribonucleotide reductases do? They take RNAs and make them into DNAs. Actually, let's see individual nucleotides. And so this process, thymidine kinase, ribonucleotide reductase, and also uracil and glycosylases, which are important for the DNA repair machinery. Um, what that does is it cuts out uracils and puts in thymidines. And that also allows you to pick up more and more of these precursors, which you need for replication purposes. So you've replicated your genome. You have all of turned off all of the splicing processes. What more do you need? Structural proteins, of course. So um, those are your true late genes. Turns out that those genes are only being transcribed and translated after you have DNA replication. That whole regulatory system is not entirely clear how that works. And these are also the ones like down here, um, UL38, again, the name is not critical, that have these downstream activation sequences um, and basically completely independent of the cellular machinery, um, at least as far as the transcriptional regulation is concerned. Still using, however, the cellular DNA-dependent RNA polymerase here. So it's all RNA polymerase too, and that you can tell because of the Tata boxes, um, which are here present in the promoters. So you've made all of these structural proteins. Now you need to put them together. These are pretty big, you know, pseudo T equals 16, a whole bunch of extra proteins. So what do you need to put these things together? Scaffolding proteins. So um, scaffolding proteins happen, again, in these herpes virus nucleocapsids, extremely similarly to what you see in bacteriophage capsid um, formation. Scaffolding proteins, um, again, the names here are not critical, come together around this scaffold. You build a nucleocapsid. This procapsid then leads to, now you've got to get rid of these scaffolds. There's a proteolysis to get rid of these scaffolding proteins. Once you have an empty prohead, now DNA needs to get packaged inside of this head process. Yeah? So this is kind of going back to replication. Yeah. But it's also transportis. Mm -hmm. Because we switched to a rolling cycle, Mm -hmm. We assume we're making from polymers of the DNA, like lambda would actually be the proof. Yeah, a bit like this. <laughs> yeah, so um, that's exactly true. So when you switch from going from um, theta replication to rolling circle replication, you're going to end up with concatenars. So multiple copies of your genome lined up one after each other and covalently linked to each other. So basically, you've got each of those segments um, lined up. Now you have recombination, which is happening. So you're flipping your S segments and you're flipping your L segments. Um, but then at the end of each of these genomes, you have these repeated sequences, which seem to be really important for packaging purposes. And so what they show here is the <clears throat> packaging 
through these repeated sequences at A. They show this sort of looping into the middle here. Whether it's actually happening with this kind of process, where you take both strands and stick them in, or it happens more like the lambda process, where you just have one end and package that one end and then cut it off again, that's a little bit controversial in terms of exactly what's going on there. I like to think about it more of the lambda process. So you take one copy of the genome, you put it in, you cut it off, you find the next capsid, um, and you put that back in there as well. Um, they have <clears throat> very clear similarities to portal proteins and terminase proteins, which again leads me to believe that it's probably much more like the lambda packaging machinery. You've got this one big long linear piece. You take one copy of the genome, you put it into a nuclear capsid, get the next copy of the genome, put it in the next nuclear capsid, and so on and so forth. <coughs> okay, so that's it for packaging. We're going to talk about how they get out of the cell next, but that packaging also includes a couple of things. So the last Laker question for today, which we actually got to, um, surprise, surprise, is the HSV1 of oh, visions? That's yeah. interesting. Um, virions, that should be, interesting typo. Um, VP16, the alpha tip, is localized as an envelope like a protein. It's a late transcript of the tegument nuclear membrane inside the nuclear capsid. Like nothing like spell check for you. I put I did put in virion. I'm sure I put in virions. <laughs> but virions, no. Yeah. Yeah. Virion. Actually, meant vision. Visions of VP16. Somebody's trying to mess up my statistics and make George look good. <laughs> so yes, it's it's in the tegument. Um, it's not a uh, latent transcript or envelope like a protein at all. So, <clears throat> um, how does that happen? How do you get these proteins into the tegument? Again, between the nucleocapsid and the actual <clears throat> membrane. Um, these Again, they're replicating inside the nucleus. That's where your genome is. All the proteins uh, get imported back into the nucleus as well. And it turns out that you can see, if you just look at infected cells that are actively producing virus, i.e. not producing the latent transcripts, um, that you see what look like native virions actually inside the nucleus, they seem to be picking up their envelope from the nuclear envelope. <coughs> and in many cases, that gets transported all the way out to the cytoplasm. And so this budding process, the budding that happens of many of these viruses is budding into the nuclear membrane. And that's where they seem to be picking up a lot of these tegument proteins. And so a lot of the tegument proteins in an infected cell are going to be here. And that's the orange that you can see here. The problem is, is when you look at cells infected with these viruses, you see all kinds of different things. You see these nuclear capsids getting exported, sometimes passing through the nuclear membrane, being released on the outside, and then finally getting out through these secretory vesicles. Um, most people think that model two here, where you actually pick up the tegument proteins and they hang on as they're going through this process, um, kind of like what you were asking about, Peter, with the tegument proteins bound on the outside. That seems to be important for um, getting these tegament proteins all the way up. We'll finish up talking about latency. How do you get latent infections? Um, basically, what seems to be happening is you 
express these latency transcripts. Um, they have very stable introns that are part of them, and so these viruses seem to have escaped from that splicing inhibition, and potentially, at least in the case of HSV1, um, these are infecting neurons. When they infect neurons, they're usually way away um, from the nucleus, where you actually have the infection, the very ends of the dendrite. Those need to be transported all the way to the nucleus in order to be able to replicate. And it's probably in that transport. And the question that Peter was asking about, those tegument proteins, remember, sticking on the outside? Well, if you've moved them so far along one of these axons, it seems that you lose sometimes some of these regulatory proteins. You don't have VP16, you're not going to be able to turn on all of the alpha proteins, which you're going to need to turn on the beta proteins and turning on the gamma proteins. So it may just be this distance which is being, which seems really bizarre, that you just have a, a distance um, being an effect in terms of you know, whether it's going to be a latent infection or not. But that does seem to be the some extent the question. And you clearly do see a loss of VP16. You can look at VP16 there and see where they are. And the big question here is, you know, what the heck is going on in terms of induction? And it's really still very unclear um, what's going on there. I think we'll stop here. Um, there are a couple things. Just a real quick shout out to these animations here um, that Ed Wagner put together. Um, unfortunately, Ed passed away about 10 years ago now. Uh, but really nice overviews of binding, infection, replication, etc. Nothing new in there, but it's a nice other way of looking at some of the things we've talked about already today.